chapter 1, verse 26, it says, God says, and notice this is God. This isn't your favorite TV preacher. This isn't a denominational thing. God said, let's make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. I want you to notice right here that God's plan, his intention for man was that man would be in his image and in his likeness, that man would share in his dominion, have the same dominion over the earth, right? So that he could do it just like God. And then in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, he forms the body of Adam and then he, and he puts himself into this body, right? He puts himself into this body. And it's very interesting that a lot of Hebrew uh, scholars and, and a lot of Jewish rabbis, they teach Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 from this standpoint, that when God uh, formed and fashioned Adam's body and put himself into Adam that all the angels that were standing around and watching they could not tell which one was God and which one was Adam because they were Adam was such a uh, almost identical twin so to speak not that he was God but he looked like God he looked like God he talked like God he even smelled like it <laughs> A lot of Hebrews call it, that's the way that they teach it. And a lot of these, these rabbis, they teach it that way. That God made man in his image and his likeness, put himself into him. And he looked just like God. And the angels couldn't tell which one was which. This was God's original plan. Well, then we know the rest of the story. Genesis chapter 3. If you haven't, you can read Genesis chapter 3. You find Adam and Eve. They're being, Eve's being tempted by the serpent, right? And so they eventually sin. They lose out on the life and nature of God. They die spiritually. And then now they're in a pickle. And it caused all of this mess that we've, we've experienced all these years. But the wonderful thing is that God had a plan. And his plan was Jesus. And so this is why you see throughout scripture, Jesus being referred to as the second Adam or the last Adam. And so if you look at John chapter 1, you see God... Uh, working out this plan here to get us back to his original plan in which he started in the garden. So John chapter 1, John chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So you see right here that God puts this life, he puts himself into mankind, into Jesus here, the last Adam, the second Adam. The very same life that he put into Adam in the garden is the very same life that he put into the second Adam, the last Adam. He put this life into him. And then in verse uh, 14, it says, The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. Now look at verse 16, it says, And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. That doesn't sound like that you're missing on anything. That doesn't sound like you're lacking in any area. Of course, that makes me wonder why we sing some of the songs that we do that and the prayers that we pray like we're missing out on something we're lacking something we're waiting on God to give us something extra special so we can get the job done because he's holding out those type of songs and prayers but right here he said of his fullness we have received and grace for grace so so right here you begin to see some of this in play now I want you to look at John chapter 14 and this is where it starts to get pretty interesting John chapter 14 John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
It's interesting that this word truth here in the Greek, it literally means reality. So you could essentially say, Jesus is standing here and he said, I am the way, I am reality. In other words, if you want to see what's really real, look at me. If you want to see what's possible from heaven, look, if you want to see heaven's reality on the earth, look at me. Look at me. He said, I am reality. I am reality. And so this is why I'm always going back to Jesus. I don't care what's been said, what's been preached, what I've read. I'm always going back to Jesus to see what's reality. So even over the last two years of all the COVID mess, it was, it was interesting to me that nobody was talking about Jesus. And I was mad at a lot of my, my faith buddies, my faith friends, because nobody's talking about what would Jesus do. Everybody's talking about what would Paul do. Well, Paul said to honor the government. Jesus said heal the sick. Yes. Amen. And of course, actually, Jesus stood before the ruler of the day and said, you can't take me out. You can't kill me. And actually, Jesus referred to him in a not so nice way at one point and said, go back and tell that dog. I'm going to keep healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out devils, cleansing the lepers. Nobody was talking about Jesus, but, but Jesus is telling, telling us, I am the way, I am the truth, I am reality. I'm what's possible. I'm what's possible. And hold your place there and look at John chapter 17. We're going to come back to 14, but I want you to see this. John chapter 17, in verse uh, 16 and 17, Jesus says, this is his prayer that he's praying, this final prayer in the upper room. And he says, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth, for your word is truth. That word sanctify just very simply means to set apart. He said, Father, set them apart by your truth, by your reality, for your word is reality. He said, set them apart by your reality. In other words, as a Christian, as someone filled and united with God, our life should be set apart, not just because I have good character and good morals and good standards, but my life should be set apart because my results are totally different than the sinner. That's my reality, is that the results I get, the things that I do, the things that I say, it's far different than the person who's not filled and united with God. Jesus said, I am reality. He shows me what's possible. He's the standard. He showed me what's possible. Now, now look back at John chapter 14. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Verse 7, he said, if you had known me, you would have known my father also. And from now on, you know him and you have seen him. Now, you have to remember, Jesus is saying this as a man. He's not saying this as God. He's saying this as a man. You, you have to understand, you have to remove this sacred cow. Jesus was not doing life as God. Yes, he was God, but Philippians chapter 2 says that he basically laid aside everything that gave himself an advantage in life. He humbled himself and came and did life as a man. This is why he was able to be our sacrificial lamb. This is why I said that he was tempted in every way, but didn't sin. Hey, wake up call. God can't be tempted, Amen. but a man can. Amen. It says in Luke chapter two, that the child Jesus grew not only in stature, but he also grew in wisdom. Well, God doesn't grow in wisdom, but a man does. Acts chapter 10 and verse 38, how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power, who went about doing good and healing all those oppressed by the devil for God was with him. God doesn't need to be anointed, but a man does. Everything that Jesus did, he did it as a man, anointed by God, filled with God, united with God. Every person he raised from the dead, he did it as a man. Every devil that he cast out, he did it as a man. Come on, turning water into wine, did it as a man. Multiplying the food, did it as a, as a man. He did it as a man. What's some of the other things he did as a man? Oh, let's see. He walked on water, not as God. He walked on water as a man. Yep. He walked. All these things, he did it 
as a man filled with God. Now, if, if Jesus did all these things as God, then hey, certainly I honor him, I worship him. But if Jesus did it as a man, I still honor and worship him. But it also compels me to go and do what he did. With no excuses. So if I can see what Jesus is doing, if I see him doing it as a man filled and united with God, it shows me what I can do. It shows me what's possible. It shows me what's possible. And Jesus as a man says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. As a man, Jesus says this. Now, if you were to say it, people would burn you at the stake. Because who do you think you are? You're just a man. You're just a woman. Well, so was Jesus. He was righteous. He was the righteousness of God, filled with God, united with God, anointed by God. He's doing life just like you. But perfect in, his, in all his ways, sinless, and says, if you've seen me, you've seen him. I am reality. I'm not only the way to the Father, I'm also the way that you can live. I am the way, the truth, and life. If you've seen me, if you, it, from now on you know him and you've seen him. Verse 8, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it's sufficient for us. Jesus said, have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? If you've seen me, you've, you've what? As a man anointed by God, he's saying, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Verse 10, do you not believe that I'm in the Father and the Father's in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. This right here is where you pull out the shotgun and you start shooting the cows. Because everybody wants to say the reason Jesus was able to work the miraculous, raise the dead, cast out devils, cleanse the lepers, cause the paralyzed to walk, the blind to see, the deaf to hear, the mute to speak, because he was doing it as God. Well, if he was doing it as God, praise him, but that means I can't do it. it means it's not possible because I'm not God. But if he was doing it as a man, that means the door just got blown wide open. But people want to say, well, he did it because he was God. But Jesus just says, I can do nothing in and of myself. It's the Father on the inside of me that's doing the works. You'll find that Jesus is always talking about union with the Father. I mean, it, the book of John, it's actually interesting. Uh, most Bible scholars would tell you that the book of John represents 19 days in, in the life and ministry of Jesus. 19 days. And over and over and over and over and over in the book of John, he's constantly talking about, I'm one with the Father. The Father in me. The Father sent me. The Father working through me. It's always about union with the Father. It's like, Jesus, when are you going to come up with another message? Because that's all you keep talking about. <laughs> but guys, think about it. In 19, if you, if you read through John, you'll find it over and over and over and over. Well, but what you talk about a bunch, you're thinking about it even more. Right? What you talk about, you're thinking about even more. This was on Jesus' mind a lot. He's thinking about this. <clears throat> His mindset is on this. He said, do you not believe I'm in the Father and the Father in me? The Father who dwells in me, he does the works. Believe me that I'm in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. This shows me right here that because of union, union should produce results. Union should produce the miraculous. Union with God should produce the supernatural. Jesus said, if you don't believe what I'm saying, believe the works that I'm doing. The works prove that what I'm saying is true. Is it any wonder today why a lot of people don't want anything to do with Christianity? Because a lot of times all we have is words. We, we've been preaching a, a good preach for decades now and haven't really produced a lot of results and then then we wonder why a lot of people just don't want it it's interesting to me that jesus and the father actually thought i mean i don't know what they were thinking but they actually thought that we <laughs> that we uh being a little carnal might need to see some supernatural things to prove this absolutely supernatural message that we might need some things on the outside some physical stuff to prove this spiritual message 
that we might need some physical things to prove something that you can't see. This almost too good to be true news, this wonderful gospel. Jesus said, if you don't believe what I'm saying, believe the works. But he said, these works, they prove that I'm one with him. These works prove that I'm one with him. And yet he also said, it's the father on the inside of me that's doing the works. So it's almost like, okay, Jesus, you know, it's a little two-faced here. You got, you're talking out of both sides of your mouth. Which one is it? You just said it's the father doing the works. But then over here you say, but if you don't believe what I say, believe the works that I do. So which one is it? Is it you or is it the father? It's both. It's two working as one. It's union. It's union. So here's Jesus doing life as a man, filled with God, united with God, anointed by God, God working on the inside of him. And he's letting us know that this union that he has with the Father should be producing results. So then he goes on to say, verse 11, believe me that I'm in the Father, or the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works, because I'm going to the Father. Jesus actually believed that you and I would be able to do exactly what he did. Who would have thunk it? I was actually talking to a, I've got this, uh, I've got this Muslim guy that's been hounding me on Instagram for a couple of months. And he's been sending me these, these messages and, and just trying to argue with me. But I know he's actually searching because why would you waste your time arguing with me? Because I, I, I'm the wrong one to argue because I'm just going to, even if I have to cheat, I'm going to win. Like I'm, <laughs> I, will always, I will always win. I, I loathe losing. <laughs> I just, God made me to be a winner. I just win. I'll, I'll do anything I have to do but to win. I mean, just to show you, just show you how bad I am. I've gotten better, but, I, but I'm still pretty bad. I remember we were... Uh, my wife and I, we were pastor. We started our first church in College Station, Texas, and we were pastoring. And, and there was this little boy named Liam, nine years old, sweet little kid, blonde hair, blue eyes. And, and we were having this little get-together at our house, and, and we, <laughs> we had a, a foosball table. Oh, no, no, this, it was another, this was another kid I, I demolished. So we had, a, we had an air hockey table. And so we're playing air hockey, and I'm up 49 to nothing <laughs> with this nine-year-old. Just boom, boom, boom. And, Lacey, and the mom comes in there. She's laughing. Lacey looks at me. She goes, what are you doing? He's nine years old. I was like, why am I not going to give me? He's got to learn. He's got to learn. I'm not, not going to give you. you know? And then, you know, then, then our son comes along. And, you know, I'm, I'm trying to man him up. So and Lacey's getting mad at me because I'm not letting him win the video games. I'm just real competitive. We've got to win here. And so I, I want the first place trophy. Nobody ever remembers second place. And, <laughs> yeah, second place is still a loser, so I don't want to lose. So he said, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I'm going to the Father. Well, what was the result of Jesus going to the Father? It was going to produce what? Salvation. So that the same Spirit who was in him would get where? In you. And remember, Jesus said, it's the Father on the inside of me who's doing the works. So if it was the Father on the inside of him doing the works, and then the Father gets on the inside of you, that must mean that the very same works that Jesus did, you should be able to do also. I mean, people talk about the greater stuff. Let's just get the same works going, at least, you know. But I had this Muslim guy, he's been arguing with me, and, and we were talking about this verse, and he said, you can't possibly take that literally, can you? I said, yes, I take that literally. Jesus said it. He said, I could do what he did. Well, what did Jesus do? See, a lot of people take this, this scripture right here, and we relegate it to the things that, that fit our little peanut brain. And that, well, you know, and this is why the church is, for the most part, turned into a social service organization instead of a supernatural organization. 
And that when there's a pandemic going on, see, this was interesting to me that in the midst of the pandemic, nobody was praying for people, but we, we begin to rely on our natural means. And so we're providing food and clothing and, and financial help, which is all great. And we should do those things. But like, where was the supernatural piece? Where, where was us using our supernatural toolbox? Where, where was the church doing the works of, of Jesus? Because it's interesting that when John the Baptist is starting to question things with Jesus and sends his disciples to Jesus and says, are you really the Christ? I mean, this is the guy who baptized him in the Jordan River and announced him as the Messiah. Now John the Baptist is questioning things and John the Baptist sends his disciples to Jesus and Jesus Here's the question, and then he goes and heals the sick, calls the blind to see, the deaf to hear, the lame to walk, the dead to be raised. And then he turns around and tells the disciples, now go back and tell John what you saw and what you heard. And what was the blind see, the deaf hear? He didn't say go back and tell John about all the people that's been in the meetings. Go back and tell John about all the books that I've published and all the TV shows that I've been on and all the networks that we own. He didn't say anything. He said, go back and tell him about all the supernatural stuff you just saw. Like there has to be miracles. There has to be signs. There has to be wonders. And Jesus actually acted like it was supposed to be normal for those who were one with the Father. Well, then he goes on in verse 19. And he said, a little while longer and the world will see me no more. But notice this, he says, you will see me because I live you will live also. But wait a minute, he's talking to people that are alive. He's not talking to dead people. He's talking to people physically that are alive standing right in front of him. And he said, because I live, you will live also. Yeah, but he's talking to spiritually dead people. And he's letting them know that on that day, when I'm raised up, when I'm alive, you're going to live too. And at that day, the day of salvation, verse 20, you will know that I am in my Father, you are in me, and I am in you. So now Jesus is letting us know what the salvation experience is really supposed to be all about. Notice he didn't say on that day, you'll know you're getting to go to heaven. (laughs) On that day, you'll know you just won the golden Willy Wonka ticket to heaven. (laughs) On that day, you'll know That that day, that sweet day, long down the road, it's going to be hell on earth, but that one day, you're going to get to go to heaven. No, he said, on that day, you're going to know that I'm in the Father, you are in me, and I am in you. On that day, you're going to know that the Godhead just moved on the inside of you. And he said, you're going to know it. He's talking about an experiential knowledge. He's not talking about facts and data. He's not talking about you being intellectual and you being smart and all your degrees in academia. No, he's talking about experiential knowledge, a knowing, an intimate knowing through experience of a union taking place between you and the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Interesting story. So I was actually at Pastor David's church in Canton, Georgia, um, this was a year, was it a year and a half ago? The, gr- the girl with the pink hair, is it? Last May. Okay, so last May. So I was, at, I was at his church last May in Canton, Georgia, and I'd walked in, and there was this girl that had, this young girl that had purple hair, or pink hair, one of them. <laughs> Wild hair. And, uh, and so I'm walking by, and I, and I hadn't been there before, and I walked by, I'd never met her, and I didn't pay much attention to her, just the hair stuck out to me. And all by, I said, hey, I like that hair. Wish I could do that. Just kind of walk by. Just kind of, you know, smiling and laughing. So we get going with service. And during the service, I told kind of a little bit of my testimony about how I grew up in church, but never saw anything, never experienced thing. By the time I'm 20 years old, I'm questioning even if God is even real. I mean, literally questioning, is he real? And ended up, uh, stopped going to church for about 10 months. Went to service this one night, these revival meetings, had this just tremendous encounter with God and found out God was real, a supernatural encounter with him. Basically what happened was I'm sitting in the back of the church. I hadn't been in church for for nine months. I didn't want to be there and I'm I'm mad. I'm missing a basketball game. I'm supposed to just pick up games and, and I'm sitting in the back, my arms folded. I don't want to be there. 
And I don't I have no idea what the preacher's saying. But at the end of the service, he said, so he said, before we go, if there's anyone here, uh, you know, you need hands laid on you. You want somebody to, to pray with you. You just need a touch from God. I want you to come up here. And so I remember sitting back there. I mean, I just turned 20 years old. Just a few days after 20. I remember sitting back there with my arms folded. I said, all right, God, if you're real, I want to see what you've got. <laughs> really, I did. Just arrogant, mad at the world, mad at God if he's even real. And, and the sad thing was I grew up in church. I was in church three, four times a week. Grew up in a good, solid, faith, Bible-based church. My dad was on the board. He was, he was on the worship team, killer electric lead guitar player. and So we're in church all the time. But I'm questioning if God's even real. And so I walk up to the front. And uh, so they had a line of people. I'm, I'm standing there and I'm being respectful. I lift my hands up. And so the, the minister, he's laying hands on people going by. And there's a lady standing next to me. God is my witness. He put his hands on her head. And I'm watching. I, I got my eyes open. I got my hands like this. When he put his hands on her head, it was like electricity went through my head. I mean, I felt it. And I was not a runner, dancer, shouter, or anything like that. You know, at our church, I mean, at the, at, at the most, back in the 80s, you know, at the most, it was the kangaroo hop type of deal. <laughs> And then if it got wild, it was the Jericho March, if you know. Okay. <laughs> so, but I, but I felt, it was literally like I stuck my finger in a socket. I felt it go through my body. And it was like my feet were on fire. I didn't know what else to do. So I took off running around this church and then just fell out under the power of God. And I knew he didn't touch me because I'm watching. So at Pastor David's church, so I'm telling this story. Well, after I got through with that story, we began ministering to people. And there was a lady that was sitting on this side and she was completely deaf in her, in her left ear, I believe. We didn't minister to her or anything. Her ear opened up instantly in the service. Well, the girl with the purple hair was sitting about four to five feet away from her and saw that. And so at the end of the service, uh, I'm talking to people and the girl with the purple hair and her mother comes up. And the mom says, hey, would you mind talking to my daughter? And I said, okay, so what's, what's going on? And, uh, and the girl with the purple hair, and I'm seeing her, and she's got kind of this, this goth thing going. And she said, um, I, she said, I saw that deaf lady get healed. That was pretty cool. And I said, yeah, that was pretty cool. I said, it was cool that, you know, I didn't, did you see me pray for her, lay hands on her? No. So that was Jesus right there. You experienced Jesus. And, and the Lord just started giving me some words of knowledge about her. And, and I started talking to her. And I said, you know, I said, you experienced Jesus right there. And, and no amount of witchcraft and playing with, with gems and, you know, and jewels and all these type of things. And while I'm saying this, she looks at her mother and goes. <laughs> and she goes, she looks at her mom and goes, how did he know that? <laughs> and. And so she admits that she had been, she had gotten involved in witchcraft. Uh, uh, her girlfriend at the time, her girlfriend's father had been involved in it, got them involved in it, and they'd been doing some stuff. And so, so the, the, the short version is, I told her, I said, look, you just experienced Jesus. So now you're in a pickle. Because you can't walk out of here saying, I, you know, I don't believe. You just had an experience. You just had an encounter here, you know. So you have to walk out of here rejecting him because you just experienced him. You just saw manifestation here. I said, so let's just go ahead and, and, and pray together. And she said, okay. So we, we say the salvation prayer. She receives Jesus. And then, and so after we get done, she goes, hey, before you go, she said, you know, when you talked about when you're at church and you had that encounter with God and you found out God was real. I said, yeah. She said, I want that too. Now, I don't know about you, but I... I I didn't say, I didn't show it on the outside, on the inside. I was like, is that possible? I mean, can, can, can I pray for that? And so I just looked there and I said, sure. Like I knew what I was doing. So, <laughs> so I grabbed her hand. And so I just very simply, I, I'll be honest. I didn't know if it was going to work. I grabbed her hand and I, I said, father, <laughs> I said, father, I just ask you right now what you gave me. I ask you to give it to her right now. God is my witness. I didn't feel a thing. God is my witness. I'm holding her hand. All of a sudden, she starts going like this. I mean, just shaking like crazy. And I just, you know, I was like, is the devil coming out? Like, what's going on? You know? 
And so I let go of her hand. I'm just watching. She just, she just, she just. and so whenever she stopped, her, she, whenever she stopped, she looked at her mother and she goes, whoa. <laughs> she said, and the mom said, what, what did you, what did you feel? She said, that was better than any drug. She said, it felt like fire going through my body. She said, it felt like my bones were going to rattle out of my body. Well, what happened was this right here. On that day, you'll know that I'm in the Father, the Father's in me, and I am in it. You'll know by experience. And then he goes on, verse here, and he says, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it's he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him, and I will manifest myself. I will reveal myself to him. I've often wondered, how come we're not seeing Jesus a whole bunch? Because Jesus just said right here, on the day of salvation, the world won't see me, but you will. And I'll manifest myself. I'll reveal myself to you. It's very interesting. It was, it was years ago, my, my son, he was three years old. And we were in College Station. And, you know, we were at that stage with him where we're trying to get him to stay in his room when we went to sleep. And he would crawl out of his you know, his junior size bed or whatever and try to come in there and because he was at that point, he didn't want to stay in there by himself at night. And so I remember he came into our room one night and uh, we, were, we were in our bedroom and so the, the back wall of our bedroom's here. There's a, a double window, the, the headboard's here. And so my son was sitting here on this side of the bed and he's crying, he's upset. I'm standing over here by the doorway and I was talking to him, trying to console him. Lacey's over here on this side. And we're talking to him, telling him, hey, there's nothing to be scared of, all this type of thing. And he's just crying and crying. All of a sudden, while we're talking to him, I mean, he's just bawling his little eyes out. And while he's crying, he goes. I'm like, what you here? I mean, I must have gave some words of wisdom to my three-year-old, you know. And he just stops. And he's, he's looking up like this and smiling. And I said, Jake. What's going on? He goes, Daddy, I'm fine. I'll go in my room now. And I said, uh, okay, well, well, well what, you know, what, what changed? He said, Jesus is here. Three years old. Barely three. Jesus is here. Now I'm thinking, and did we watch Veggie Tales today? I mean, is it something like that? You know, I'm not really thinking. But he's sitting there. I mean, obvious, stark, drastic change. He said, Jesus is here. He's just smiling. And I said, um... What's he doing? He said, he's smiling at me. And I said, um, what's he wearing? He said, he's got a white robe and a big red belt. And I said, and where's he at? He's right here, daddy. He said, I'll go to my room now, I'm fine. Gets up, walks out, goes to his room. A couple weeks later, we're at church. And had kind of a, just a, a, a normal Sunday morning service and stuff. And this couple comes up to me. They've been coming to our church for about six months. They come up to me and they said, hey, w would you and, and Pastor Lazy, you know, have, have dinner with us one night? We want to talk to you about some things. I said, sure. So we ended up meeting them. They came over to our house on a, uh, a weeknight. We're having dinner. And the, the dad goes, to look, I just want to let you know, we're not real spiritual people. You know, we've been coming to church for a little bit. And he said, we don't talk really much about God at home. I hate telling you you're the pastor, but, you know, we don't really talk much about this type of stuff. But he said, last Sunday, um, he said, our, our son, he, he was four years old. His name was Nicholas. And he said, we kept Nicholas in with us in big church with adults. He didn't go back to, to the nursery. And so he stayed with us. And after service, we went home. We we're having lunch. and We we're talking about the day. And in the middle of conversation... Nicholas just brings up, we're talking about church. Nicholas brings up about Jesus being at church that day. And the dad said, what do you, what do you mean Jesus at church? And, he, and then four-year-old Nicholas said, Jesus in big church today. And the dad said, well, where was Jesus? And he said, Jesus was on the stage with the big people. And the dad stops and goes, now let me tell you again, like we're not real spiritual people. We don't really talk about things like this at home. And he says, so I began to question. He said, well, where, where was Jesus again? He said, Jesus was on the stage with the big people. 
And he said, what was, the dad said, what was Jesus doing? This is what got me. He said, Jesus was on the stage with the big people. And he said, when the big people would lift their hands, Jesus worship and surrender. He said, Jesus would reach out his hands. Four years old. <clears throat> so you have two little boys. And I kept, the other things started happening. And then I came across this verse. I'm like, okay, there should be some experiences and encounters here. Maybe one of the reasons that we're not having these experiences and encounters with God is because we've been in church too long and the church people told us it's not possible. Church people said that's not normal. Now, I'm not saying we should go around looking for stuff, you know, stuff like that. But I mean, Jesus is saying, hey, there should be some experiences and encounters going on because of your union and your oneness with him. He said, on the day of salvation, you'll know. That there should be some experiences and encounters. I mean, if God's living on the inside of me, shouldn't I know it? Shouldn't there be something different about me when I've got the creator of the universe living and working on the inside of me versus the person that's filled with the devil? That's right. And yet, isn't it interesting that especially in, in the modern age that we're living in today and where witchcraft is becoming very prevalent and we're just idiots about it. You know, I, I go over to Kenya a bunch and like they think as Americans, we're a bunch of stupid fools. Us Christians in America for the, for the things that we allow in our lives, in our media and this and that, because they recognize the witchcraft. They'll actually tell you there's more witchcraft in America than there is in Africa. I mean, there, if you begin to look, there really, really is. But it's interesting if you look at what goes on on the demonic side and you look at people possessed by the devil, we're kind of okay with the things that happens by possessed people. But then you talk about God being on the inside of someone and things happen and we think they're weird. Those Christians are weird. But those demonic people, we accept that as okay, that they can pull off some supernatural stunts. And all these supernatural things happen through them. But then you talk about a Christian filled with God and, and laying hands on the sick and a tumor dissolving. And they think you're, you've lost it a little bit. I've actually had people in my own circles that told me I need to start using wisdom. <laughs> yeah, you need to use wisdom, brother. I mean, you know, I, I appreciate your zeal and I appreciate your, <laughs> I appreciate your hunger. But, you know, you need to use some wisdom in these things. Well, maybe you're just telling me that because you're a coward and you're not getting any results. So you just use some wisdom, brother. Use some wisdom, brother. But Jesus is showing us this union that he has with the Father was supposed to be producing miraculous, producing supernatural things that was visible to cause experiences and encounters, not only for us and him, but also for the world to encounter him. He's saying this all through John 4. He's kind of showing you what the Christian experience is kind of supposed to be about. But then if you flip over to John chapter 17, we, look, we looked at verse uh, 17, but then look at verse 18. He said, as you sent me into the world, Father, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they would be sanctified by the truth. Verse 20, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So right now, I mean, he's very specifically praying for you and I. And Jesus always gets his prayers answered. This was Jesus' prayer before he went to the Garden of Gethsemane to turn himself over, to go to the cross. Notice what he is praying for God to bring it past. Notice the, the supernatural prophetic prayer of Jesus Christ. He prays, Father, I pray that they would be what? That they would be one. As you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, that they would also be one in us. This is Jesus' prayer. Notice he does not pray, Father, take them to heaven. This is my ultimate goal, is to get them to heaven. But friends, that's what we've made salvation to be all about, unfortunately. We've made salvation to be all about just going to heaven. Yeah. And that's why you, you have people going through hell on earth, but oh, I can't wait to get to heaven. Now, we don't believe any of it because we'll sing about it in church. When we all get to heaven, what a day it'll be. And they go to the doctor on Monday. And the doctor says, sorry, you're going to die. And they start crying. Ah, oh, what am I going to do? I don't want to die. Well, you were just singing yesterday. I can't wait till I get to heaven. <laughs> we don't believe half the stuff we sing. But notice Jesus, his primary focus was not in trying to take us somewhere. His primary focus was trying to get someone in you. 
Jesus was not endeavoring just to change your, 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 your destination. He was endeavoring to change your position. Because before him, we were far away from God. We were removed from God. We were separated from him. But through salvation, we become one with him. Jesus was about changing our position with the Father. And yet the wonderful thing is that once your position is changed, one of the wonderful byproducts is your destination gets to change too. But have you ever thought about it in reality that if Jesus was to come back today and we go to heaven, you're only going to be there seven years. And then you're coming right back for the millennial reign of Christ. A lot of people are living for seven years. And then you're coming right back. Thank God I get to go to heaven. But that isn't what my salvation experience is all about. Jesus said, Father, I pray that they would be one just as you and I are one. I'm talking about the very same degree, the very same quality, the very same union that Jesus had with the Father. Jesus said, I want them to have that too. Not only so we could produce what Jesus produced, but also so we could have the very same fellowship with the Father that Jesus had. See, I love the miracles. I love the signs. I love the wonders. I love the healings. But you know what? That comes second to getting to know him. Remember what Paul said? He said, my aim, my goal, my prize, my focus is to know him and to know the power. And I'll be honest, when we, when we first got started in ministry, I was so hungry to see stuff. So hungry to see the supernatural and miracles and stuff. When we first started our, our first church, we went with the intent, we're going to see miracles or we're going home. There was plenty of churches in town, but I wanted to see stuff. And so when we, when we got started, I mean, it was our, we started September of 2006 there in College Station. It was the first weekend of October of 2006. And there was a little grandmother. She brought her uh, grandson. He had three tumors on his head. One was about the size of a quarter. The other two were about the size of a dime. He had Hodgkin's lymphoma and four years old. And, and the short version of that is those tumors disappeared instantly in the service. And they took him, uh, he had a follow-up appointment. He was going every so often on Tuesday, went to the doctor. They couldn't find the tumors, couldn't figure out what was going on, ran all the scans, PET scans, all this, couldn't find any cancer. That happened our second month. Well, the next month, there was a lady that came in and she was completely blind. And I'll never forget, I had had a word of knowledge about this lady. She comes up, laid hands on her, had my eyes closed, opened my eyes. And there's this, there's this little lady standing in front of me. I said, what can I do for you? And she said, I can't see. And I said, and I'm 28 years old, just green as green can be in doing this. And I said, what do you mean you can't see? And she said, I can't see, son. And I'm hoping she's going to be, you know, meaning like nearsighted or something. I said, well, what do you mean you can't see? She said, I'm blind. Can't see. <laughs> can't see. Now, you know, I'm acting like I'm, I'm cool, calm, and collected on the inside, but I mean, I never play, pray for a blind woman. I, I'm just now getting going in this. Yeah. On the inside, I jumped back and uh, had to collect myself. But, you know, this blind lady gets instantly healed, walks out seeing perfectly. And so we start seeing all kind of stuff. And so, I mean, from a very selfish standpoint, I was going after the miracles and the healings, and I wanted to see stuff. But over time... We're starting to get really good results and seeing people get helped and people are starting to find out and showing up for these healing conferences that we were doing. And so then, then it started kind of changing from not just I want to see stuff, but I want to be able to help people. And so, you know, a little bit of love and compassion started showing up there, you know, this mean, rough exterior. And so we start doing that. But then over these last few years, it got to the point where, man, I love all this stuff. And I love helping people, but really, man, I just want to know him. I want to know him. I want to experience him. I want to encounter him. I want to know him better than I know my own wife. And Jesus showed us that was possible too because of union. That there was no hindrance that because I'm made alive unto him and I'm the righteousness of God in Christ, there's absolutely nothing stopping me from knowing him better than any human being. Jesus showed me he was the way he was reality. You look at Jesus, the way he talked about the father, it was actually like he talked about a person. He talked about his experiences with the father, almost like the same as he talked about hanging out with Peter, James, and John. He'd say, I only do the things that I see. 
We don't talk about that in church, but we talk about only do the things, only say the things I heard, but we don't talk about do the things I saw. We don't talk about that. We'll leave that alone. But Jesus said, this is the kind of relationship I have. Why? Because of union. But in John 17, he says, Father, I pray that they would be one as you are one with me. And I mean, they'd be one together. And then he makes this powerful statement. He says that they would be one in us, that the world would believe that you sent me. So how is it that the world's going to know by looking at you that God sent Jesus? That you would be the exact representation of him. That you would be the exact representation of him. So that you and I would literally be in a position to say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Christ. Now, we wouldn't be so bold to say that, but we should be working on that. I mean, I'm not suggesting you go to Walmart tonight after service and say, hey, want to see Jesus? Right here. <laughs> but, but I would suggest you start thinking like that in your noggin. Because why? We got to start renewing our mind and seeing things according to the reality of heaven and truly through the lens of redemption of what God originally planned for us to do and for us to be like. This was Jesus' prayer. And then he goes on and says this, And the glory that you gave me, I have given it to them, that they would be one, what? Just as we are one. He said, Father, the glory that you gave me, I gave it unto them. Is it any wonder that it says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the expectation of the glory of God. Why is it that I could expect the glory of God in my life? Because the glory Jesus had, he gave it unto me. Amen. He said, the very same glory you gave me, I've given it unto them. And then for the people who just didn't get it the first time, he says it again. I in them and you in me, that they would be made what? Oh, here, here, here's, a, here's a word to get you kicked out of church. They'd be made what? Perfect. What's perfect mean? Complete. Nothing missing. Nothing. I mean, perfect. Pristine. Perfect. I'd encourage you to do a little word study on the word perfect throughout the New Testament. You'll find some scriptures that, that literally gets you, the, you know, it gets you the boot out of church in a lot of places. Jesus made you... Salvation, redemption was so great, it made you perfect. Guys, think about this. God is so holy. He's so righteous. He's so perfect. How could he unite himself with something that had even the minutest, smallest flaw? Can't. God is righteous. He's holy. That means for you to be united with him, you have to be just as holy as he is. Oh, brother, but you don't know what I've done. It is not about what you did. It's about what Jesus did. Yeah, but, but you don't understand the life that I've lived. You don't understand the mistake I made this morning. How could I be perfect? Because you're looking at your body and you're not looking at you. Yeah, right, right. That's why. You, you're stepping outside of the grace of God because you're stepping outside of your union with Christ and you're looking at the person in the mirror instead of the person in Christ. He said that they would be made perfect in one. The Hebrews chapter, I believe it's Hebrews chapter 10 verse 23. Paul makes this, this marvelous statement. He says, Jesus perfected forever those who are being sanctified. I absolutely love that statement because it tells me that even in the midst of my mess, I'm still like the Messiah. Amen. Even while I'm working out my salvation, yeah. my father still sees me as perfect. Yes. Now it's not a license to sin and go and do whatever I want to. If I'm at that point, I'm an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> but what it's telling me is while I'm working out my salvation, while I'm renewing my mind and growing up in the things of God, he made me absolutely perfect perfect and if i am perfect that means i'm not missing anything i'm not broken in any way it means i literally am the righteousness of god in christ i am right now that's not going to win you an argument with your spouse but it'll win you an argument with the devil <laughs> i'm right jesus who knew no sin he became sin so i would become the righteousness of god in christ righteousness is not just some possession that i hold it's not some little trophy i get to put in the trophy case and say look what god did for me it is literally who you became it's a part of your identity it's who you are i am right i'm the rightness of god it's who i am it's who i am so that means no matter what i do it does not change who i am because God made me perfect. He couldn't unite himself with me if I wasn't just as perfect as him. 
He couldn't unite himself with me if I wasn't just as right as him. I have to be in the very, it's got to be the very same quality of, of righteousness. It's got to be the very same quality of holiness. It's got to be the very same quality as perfection. He said that they would be made perfect in one. That they would be made perfect in one. This shows me right here that, that when it comes to you and healing, there's nothing that you have done that's standing in your way. He made you perfect. He made you perfect. He made you perfect. There's a lot of people trying to figure out what, what do I need to do to get healed? And I wasn't going to really spend much time on the healing piece tonight. Just want to kind of establish some things tonight. But, but for some of you that's sitting here and been kind of struggling with that, well, you know, you don't, you don't understand the, the things that I've gone through, the things that I've done. I've made some mistakes. Friends, let me tell you something. The sinners who came to Jesus didn't have to get right to get healed. Isn't it interesting that the man at the pool of Bethesda, Jesus goes up to him afterward and says, go and sin no more lest the worst thing come upon you. Obviously, the reason that something happened with this guy was because of sin. And yet Jesus didn't make him confess it before he got healed. So if Jesus didn't expect that of the sinner, why would he expect something more of the one who's made right? Now, again, that's not a license to go live and do whatever you want. But what I'm saying is, you know, I've had people tell me, well, you know, I've had, I've had them tell other people, well, the reason that, you know, you're not getting healed is because your love walk isn't good enough. Well, at what point does your love walk get good enough? I can tell you right now, and Lacey will agree, I've got a long way to go. Because if I'm being honest, I can always improve my love walk with my wife. I can always be a little less snappy, a little less grumpy, you know. At what point do you get good enough? You have to see yourself in him. You have to see yourself as right. You have to see yourself as perfect. And friend, the more you begin to see yourself that way, it'll automatically begin to change the things on the outside. The more I begin to see myself in him, the more everything out here will begin to look like him. I wasn't designed to save myself, clean myself, heal myself, change myself. I got to see myself in him. This is what Jesus came to do. He came to make me perfect so that the perfection that's in me, that is me, would, would begin to change and perfect that which is on the outside. And the more I begin to see myself for who I am in him, that will begin to change what's on the outside. So when it comes to the area of healing, the more I will begin to see myself in him, my body will begin to change. We're going to get into that probably tomorrow morning. He said he made you what? Perfect. That must mean that that healing power and stuff you think that God's been holding out on you, you might actually have it right now on the inside of you. He made you what? Perfect. That means you're not missing anything. Made you perfect. Of his fullness we have received in grace for grace. I think it's, it's high time that the church actually start believing that what Jesus did was enough. That, he, that what he did was actually enough. Because if what he did isn't enough, he needs to start this thing all over and get back on the cross and redo it. I actually believe that what Jesus did was enough. I actually believe that when he said that he made me perfect, he actually did. Now, are there times I start to question things because I get a little carnal? Yeah, but that's where I need to start renewing my mind again as to who he made me to be. If I want to understand who I am, I need to look at him. If you, want to, if you want to understand who you really are, look at Jesus. Once you begin to look at Jesus, you'll stop looking at yourself as a sinner trying to get healing. See, one of the things that we've done is because we don't truly see ourselves as one with him, then we, we identify more as a sinner going to Jesus for healing than the healer with the sinner coming to us. Amen. That's good. Why? Because we're, we're saved, but we still got a cursed mindset. We still got a sinner's mindset. We still identify with a sinner more so than the healer. We, 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 we identify with the sinner more so as the son and child of God. And so that's why many times when, when people are looking at the issue of healing and teaching healing, they're, they're teaching healing from the standpoint of us being Jairus or us being, you know, uh, the woman with the issue of blood or, or us being the centurion servant. We're, we're that person. 
But friend, when I got united with him, I'm no longer the sinner trying to get to him. When I got united with him, I got in him and the healer got in me. I'm not trying to get to Jesus. I'm not trying to get my, I'm not hoping Jesus is going to pass me by. I'm not hoping he's going to show up. When I show up, he shows up. When I show up in church, God showed up. Why? I'm a carrier of him. I'm a temple of him. I'm a dispenser of him. I've got to know that God's on the inside of me because of my union with him. See, you start looking like this, and friend, I'm telling you, it'll start making you want to slap an S on your chest, put on your red underwear, put on a towel on your back like a cape, because you'll start thinking you're something super. I mean, I I grew up in the late 70s and 80s. I had the underoos, baby, and I was Superman all the way. Even jumped off the roof one time. Dun, dun, dun. I mean, like. But isn't it interesting that, that us as humanity, we identify with those superheroes? Isn't it interesting that all the superhero type movies, I mean, they're, they're the number one sellers. Look at the top sellers, you know, the, the top box office sales. And, and, and like those top 10, a lot of them, it's all superhero movies. Why? Because innately on the inside, there's something that I, we identify with. That we know God made us to be something far more superior than what we just see here. You have to understand that when you receive salvation, you you went from being just a human. That you got something, a little bit of deity that got on the inside of you. You have to understand that what Jesus said, he actually meant it, that you are not from here. That you were born of heaven. Remember when he told uh, Nicodemus in John chapter 3, he said, you must be born from above. You must be born from above. And then he said about the disciples and about us, they are not of this world as I am not of this world. And Father, as you sent me into this world, I send them into this world. For you to be sent into a place means you weren't there before. So the next time someone asks you if you believe in aliens, say, yep. You're looking at one. Do, 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 do. (laughs) <laughs> but you got to see yourself that way. You have to see yourself as I'm something extraordinary. I'm something supernatural. Why? Because I'm filled with him. I'm united with him. The same glory, I've got it. The same dominion, I've got it. The same authority, I've got it. The same life, I've got it. The same light, I've got it on the inside of me. That everywhere I go, I'm a miracle just waiting to happen. Everywhere I go, I'm the answer for, for any problem of the curse. I'm the answer. I, I'm so right that I can right the wrongs in the world. I'm the righteousness of God. I'm so right that I stand as supreme and superior over the wrong things in this world. All the things that are of the curse are beneath me. They're below me. I am their master now. I'm their master. I haven't told this before. I'll tell it with you guys. So uh, in the town that we're in, uh, I don't know how it is in Alabama, but a lot of places in Oklahoma, they've got these uh, marijuana farms just popping up all over the place. And the city that we're living in, uh, there's over 100. It's a small town, about 60,000 people outside of Tulsa. And I looked it up uh, the other day, and there's 101 legal marijuana farms. And so the, the town that we're in, I mean, you drive through and, and you know, I've got, I've got my, my four-door Jeep. I like to, you know, have the top off and the doors down and, and you're driving through and, and you're, you're smelling this stuff and you don't know whether you should, you know, inhale, exhale, you know, what, what, do, I, what do I do with this, dude? I mean, it's pretty bad. And so... <laughs> so by our house, there was this marijuana farm that opened up. And, and the, the people in our city, the, the leaders were just a bunch of morons because when they, when they, when they divided the city, they left all this vacant land across from the main city park in town. And they, they left it open and they made that the county and then everything on the other side of the city. Well, these people, they found this, this land, probably about 50 acres, and they bought all of it. And they opened up a marijuana farm directly across the street from the biggest city park. And so this is happening near our, probably, um, you know, half mile from our house. And, and I'm seeing this happening. I'm pretty ticked off because it's looking pretty trashy. And, and I know everything that's going to come from it. You're driving by it. And I mean, you're smelling it, you know. 
You don't know if you should just hold your breath or enjoy it, but you're driving by it. And so I called the city on it and I said, hey, you know, this is going on. They said, yeah, but there's, there's nothing we can do about it because they're on county property and, and the county property, you know, they're, they're legal. As long as they got the license, they can do it on, on the county property. I said, you realize it's stupid. There's kids literally playing across the street on the swings. And they said, yeah, it was prior governance, but there's nothing we can do about it. So I'm kind of mad about it. Well, a few months before I, I was over in Kenya and I was, don't, don't judge, but I was hanging out with these former and current witch doctors and talking to them about some things, some spiritual things and talking about our words and this and that. And I was really taken back by their understanding of, of spiritual dominion and, and using the power of their words and cursing things. And I kind of had this on my mind for a few weeks when I'm driving by and seeing this marijuana farm. And I'm kind of ticked off about it. I've already called the city. They can't do anything about it. And I've been chewing on some things. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I've got authority. I've got dominion. And so one day I was driving by and I stopped and I looked at it. And I said, I curse you. And drove by. About two weeks later, I'm driving by and there's a sign out front. It says wood and metal for sale. I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. They're pulling down the fence. They're pulling the, the plastic off the thing. The thing shut down. So I didn't say anything to Lacey. So we're driving by one day. I went, we went and dropped her truck off uh, at the mechanic. We're driving by and she goes, hey, look at that. I said, yeah, I cursed it. She said, you did what? <laughs> you know, it was like different show. What you talking about with this? <laughs> she said, what? I said, I cursed it. She said, like, for real? Like you, I said, yeah. I said, I drove by. I said, I stopped. I looked at that point. I said, I curse you. You drop and die, I curse you. I said, I curse that bad boy. I felt like Superman, you know. <laughs> like, I'm right. I'm perfect. Why? Because I'm complete. I'm one with him. I'm one with him. This is what Jesus is talking about. I and them and you and me that they would be made perfect in one that the world would know. He says it again for the second time that the world would know that you sent me again. How's the world going to know that God sent Jesus? The creation is groaning and yearning and waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. How's the world going to know we're truly representatives of him when we can produce him? We, I mean, for, for 40 years now, we've been hearing phenomenal teaching about faith and authority and dominion and this and that. But friends, I'm telling you, the world doesn't need to be preached at. They also need to be demonstrated. They need to have some experiences to prove that this thing that we're talking about is true. Even this little Muslim guy that won't leave me alone. I keep showing him videos and testimonies of people because I keep telling him, look, you don't believe the Bible. I don't believe your book, but I've got something to prove to you that what I'm talking about is true. Watch these testimonies. Watch these testimonies. Here's this guy with MS. Here's this guy that was blind. Here's this lady that was blind. Here's this and here's that. What are you going to do with that? Because your God can't do that. Your God can't do that. Isn't it interesting that Jesus in the Great Commission, he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel and signs and wonders will follow those who will believe. Jesus actually believed that the world needed some signs and wonders to believe it. Who would have thunk it? That Jesus actually believed that carnal people would need a sign. That word sign in, in the Greek, it literally means this. It means to authenticate the message and the messenger. Jesus actually believed that you and I would need to go out and prove some things that would authenticate the message and authenticate you as the messenger. Jesus' message here, the, the ultimate priority thing was union, union, union. And that it would do what? It would produce. It would produce, not just taking you to heaven, but producing something through you. He said that the world would know that you have sent me and that you've loved me as, loved them as you love me. Verse 24, he says, Father, I desire that they whom you gave me would be where I am. Oh, wait. Oh, yeah. By the way, I want them to go to heaven with me. Like, look at, the, look at where the priority is of you going to heaven. It's after he's repeated twice now, Father, I want them to be in you. I want you to be in them. And Father, I want them to go where I'm going. 
But then notice, was, notice the very last thing that he says in this prayer here in John chapter 17, verse 26. He said, I've declared to them your name and I will declare it that the love with which you love me would be in them. And notice the very last words out of his mouth and that I would be in them. That I, the last words Jesus prays here, he said that I pray that I would be in them. That I would be in them. This, this salvation experience was to radically, radically change our life. Not just take us somewhere, but actually begin to produce some things in this world. Now let me show you something real quick and we'll, we'll, we'll close up here. Look at Romans chapter 6. We're going to spend some time in Romans chapter 6 tomorrow. Romans chapter 6 and verse 4 it says, therefore, we were buried with him, buried with Christ through baptism to death. Notice this, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. We should also walk in a new type of life. Wait a minute. He said, just as Jesus is experiencing a new life, you and I are to be experiencing a new life. So this is where it goes even further in this thing. And this will really get you kicked out of a lot of churches. Because while Jesus is on the earth, he's saying, the Father's going to be in you, just as he, is, as he is in me. And his prayer, he's praying that the Father would be one with you as he is with me. And he's telling us that we would do the very same works and even greater works because he's going to the Father. How is it that you and I are going to be able to do even greater than what Jesus did on the earth? How is that possible? Well, it says right here, just as Jesus was raised by the glory of the Father, even so we should all go walk in newness of life. First John chapter 4 and verse 17 says, As Jesus is, present tense, in heaven, so are we in this world. Friends, you and I were not united with the Christ who walked on the earth. We're united with the glorified Christ seated at the right hand of God. That means you and I can walk in something great. Isn't it interesting that when Jesus uh, sends out the, the 12 and look at Luke chapter 9, sends out the 70 in Luke chapter 10, and he tells them, he says, I give you authority. I give you power. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils. But then after Jesus has been raised from the dead in the Great Commission, and he says, now all authority and all power in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. It was the first time he said all. Remember, Jesus was operating under the old covenant. But now this new covenant being established. And he said, all of it's mine. And now I'm giving it unto you. So now you and I have it even better than the disciples did when they walked with Jesus. And that you and I can literally walk as Jesus walks. Now, this, friends, the only difference between you and Jesus right now is your body. Think about it. I know it's a little do 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 do, but think about it. You're a spirit. He's a spirit. You're the righteousness of God. He's the righteousness of God. You're one with Him. He's one with you. As He is, so are you. The only difference between you and him, he has his glorified body. You still got your earthly body. But you are not a body. You are a spirit. And you are alive unto God. You're alive unto God. Your body does not limit what you can do for God. The things that you've done does not limit what you can do for God. If you want to know what's possible, look at Jesus. If you want to know what's possible, look at Jesus. Have you actually ever thought about when he walked on the water? I've been thinking about this. Have you ever thought about when he walked on the water? What was the purpose of that? Nobody got saved because of that. Nobody got healed because of that. He was actually doing it at night by himself where nobody could see him. What in the world? He wasn't showing off for anybody. This wasn't to draw a crowd. This is just Jesus. Out there on his own, exercising 
and working on his dominion. Can't prove it, can't disprove it. This is just me. I'm, I say this is opinion. Can't prove it, disprove it. I think Jesus was out there just working on his dominance of the world. Just my opinion on it. Because nobody was around. He's out there in the middle of the night, all by himself. One of the times it says when he was walking by, he was going to walk by the disciples. But they called out for him. Jesus is just out there all on his own. You start to see when you look at Jesus, you start to see this mindset that he had, his perspective that he had, that he was thinking a different way. Because he understood there was another reality. There was, there was this alternate reality in which I can live in while I'm walking on this earth. You look at the way that he, he viewed the problems of the world, like even when he was dealing with the sick people. And many times he didn't even actually respond to the sickness or disease. He didn't even act like there was a problem. He told a blind man, just go home. <laughs> well, that's inconsiderate. But Jesus actually acted like this is the way that it's supposed to be. He told the lepers that came to him, just go show yourself to the priest. He didn't reach out and shandai. He didn't do anything. He didn't spit, slobber, nothing. Didn't sling, nothing. Just go show yourself to the priest. When he found out Lazarus was dead, he finds out on day two, intentionally waits two more days. And then he, he tells the disciples, hey, um, Lazarus is asleep. We need to go wake him up. Now, Jesus knows the dude is dead. But in Jesus' mindset, raising the dead was no different than waking somebody up from a nap. But Jesus is doing this as a man. He's looking at this. He's got a brain like you, a body like you. He's doing this as a man filled with God, united with God. But his perspective was different. He saw things from a heavenly perspective that the things of this world, because I'm the righteousness of God, the things of this world, the things of this curse are a little deal. He saw death as a little deal. Now, if somebody died and we needed to raise them up, you know full well we would be calling everyone to fast and pray. We Everybody get your church praying, the small groups praying. We need everybody praying to bombard the gates of heaven to get God to raise this person up. Jesus didn't do any of that. He simply went to go wake someone up from a nap. But then the disciples, being real carnal, said, hey, if he's asleep, you know, he'll wake up. And Jesus goes, look, guys, Lazarus is dead. But we're gonna, I'm going to go raise him up. Jesus wasn't denying the circumstance, but Jesus saw it different. But he had to come down on, on the, the disciples' level and say, look, guys, he's dead. So was Jesus lying when he said he's just asleep? No. From heaven's perspective, it's a small deal. Isn't it interesting in Luke chapter 5 when, when Jesus is dealing with the paralyzed man, he actually thought that healing the paralytic was no different than forgiving somebody. He didn't act like it was a big deal. Why would it be a big deal when you stand as a master over those things? Why would it be a big deal when you have absolute dominion over these things? Why would it be a big deal from where I'm from actually created what I can see? Jesus saying this as a what? As a man filled with God, united with God, anointed by God, with God on the inside of him doing the works. But the problem is, is that many of us were trying to replicate Jesus without seeing like Jesus. And so what it's produced is a lot of us trying to mimic, trying to formulize, trying to come up with keys and steps and principles to work the miraculous. And it's not going to work. Jesus said in John 15, 4, 5, and 6, he said, I'm the vine and you are the branch. If you'll abide in me and I abide in you, you will produce much fruit. Where does the miraculous and the supernatural flow from? From our connection with him. From our connection with him, not your faith formulas. It's interesting that even our faith formulas don't have fellowship in them. Our faith formulas many times don't have God in them at all. It's just tell me what I need to do. What are the steps? What are the keys? What's the principles? What's the ABCs? Tell me what I need to do. What I need, what I need to do. Get saved. Because once you get saved, you get connected. But then you've got to stay connected here. You know, Psalm 91, whoever what? Dwells 
All those promises of Psalm 91, they're not for everybody. It's for one person, the person who dwells. The person who stays connected. The person who's staying connected in that secret place in Christ. The one who, who stays one with Him. Legally, in one sense, the position never changes, but it's what's going on right here. How am I seeing myself? Do I see myself as a sinner? Do I see myself as a person who, who doesn't have healing? Do I see myself as the person that's on defense trying to get the ball? Or do I see myself as the one who's in Him, who's always on offense, always victorious, always righteous, always holy? Amen. Come on, always the one with the ball who's got it all. Amen. Grace for grace, the fullness of Him. That's me. I've got to see myself that way. Because if I don't see myself as Him, then I'm always going to be lacking. If I don't see myself as Him, in Him, then I'm going to walk around in condemnation. And I'm never going to get anything to work. So never going to get anything to work if I see myself outside of my union with Him. It's all about what? Union. It's all about connectedness. It's all about becoming one with Him. That's why Jesus came. To connect you with the Father. Colossians chapter 2 verse 9. It says, Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. If Paul stopped right there, praise God. But then he continued on. He brought you in it. And he said, and you are complete in him. Jesus is the fullness of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost wrapped up in a body. And you are complete in him. Now it's the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, and you in a body. Amen. You in a body. And yet we're praying and weeping and crying and singing, waiting for God to give us something more because we don't think we have enough. Isn't it interesting, Paul, when he prays in Ephesians chapter 1, 15 through 21, he said, Father, I pray that you would give them wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you, that the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened, that they would know the plan of God, they would know the inheritance that you have in the saints, and they would know the exceeding greatness of your power that's in us and for us who believe. Paul prayed, Father, I pray that they would know that this dead-raising power is on the inside of them. The church today is praying, God, give us this dead-raising power. Is it any wonder we're not operating in this dead raising power? Because we don't think we have it. But Paul, the Apostle Paul is saying, God, help them to know they have it. And the church is over here singing and praying, God, give it to us. And Paul is over here praying, God, show them they have it. But the church is over here saying, we don't have it. We need more. We don't have enough. But Paul is saying, God, help them open up their eyes. Help them to stop being idiots and see that it's on the inside of them. Why? Because of their union with Christ. Because of their union with Christ. Because of their union. This is why Paul said in Colossians 2 verse 6, As you have received Him, now walk in Him. In one sense, he doesn't even say believe for it. Jesus was telling them to believe for things. Paul's telling you to walk in it. Why? Why would you have to believe something that you already received? You just have to walk in it. I mean, that's something to chew on tonight while you go to bed. But think about it. Why, why would you have to believe something that you already received? Maybe I just need to walk it. Maybe I just need to know I have it and walk in it. So in the area of healing, and I promise I'll stop right here. In the area of healing, maybe I already got it. Maybe I'm not looking for it. Maybe I'm not searching for it. Maybe, not God, maybe God's not holding out. Maybe when I got saved, I actually got it. Maybe, just maybe, 1 Peter 2.24 is actually true. <laughs> that Jesus became the curse for it, became sinful, that I died to sin. So I can live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Maybe, just maybe, when I became righteous, it put me in the position for healing to flow. Maybe, just maybe, that when I became the righteousness of God, when I became one with Him, when I became perfect and complete and holy, that I also became healed. That healing wasn't just a possession, that healing actually became who I am. Amen. That it became a part of my identity. Maybe, just maybe, it's who I am. Maybe, just maybe, it's a part of me. Maybe, just maybe. Maybe, just maybe, it's possible. I think it is. 
that by the stripes of Jesus you were you were why because I was made right because I was made perfect maybe just maybe the reason I'm not experiencing the things I need to because I'm looking at this which isn't perfect instead of me who is Maybe, just maybe, I'm, I'm looking in the wrong warehouse. I'll give you one more story, and then we'll go, I promise. <laughs> so, when I was in college, okay, college boy, and, uh, and so, you know, college boys, and so, <laughs> yeah, so, my, my, my friend, my best friend, he was my college roommate, we were playing college, we were playing basketball together, and his, his, his brother's uh, fiance was the manager of Victoria's Secret. And so we're home, we come home from, from break for a semester and she needs two stock boys. And we said, sign us up. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm 21 years, I'm, I'm 20 years old. I said, sign me up. I will come and work at Victoria's Secret. And so we're working there as stock boys. Now, I mean, and so we would go in there and we're in charge of inventory and unloading the trucks and doing stuff. But we would work really, really hard so we could hurry up and get out on the floor. Now, it, now this, is, this isn't, you know, modern day. This is back, you know, some years ago. And so it took a couple of months for us to prove to the women we weren't gay. Because they couldn't figure out why these two dudes want to work in a lingerie store. And we're trying to help them understand, look, we're 20-year-old boys. I mean... There's ladies in here. And so, but the reason of the story is, is that we, we did inventory. And so people would come in there and maybe, maybe something wasn't on the floor and these ladies would be asking about it. Maybe they saw it and it's not there anymore. And many times the, the ladies work on the floor. They said, oh, I'm so sorry we're out of that. And we might overhear it. There was many times we overheard it and said, no, 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 we actually have that in the warehouse. You may not see it here, but, but we do have it. So we would go back there and we'd go to the warehouse and bring it out because we knew it was in the warehouse. And the problem is for a lot of us, we're looking in the wrong warehouse. We're looking for something spiritual in the physical. And healing is a spiritual thing because righteousness is a spiritual thing, but it's to affect the physical world as well. My righteousness, my salvation was not just to affect my spirit, me as a spirit being. It was also to affect my body. And maybe just maybe the reason we're not seeing progress in the areas we know we should is because I'm looking at this instead of looking at me. Notice what I'm saying. I'm not looking at me. I'm looking at my body. This body came from Texas. God bless Texas. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> but Chad came from heaven. The body came from Texas. But Chad came from heaven. I need to stop looking at my body and I need to start looking at me. Why? Because me is the one who's united with him. Me is the one united with him that can produce exactly, and I mean exactly what he produced. Why? Because he said it. Because he said it. Father, I pray that they would be one, just as you and I are one, that the world would know that you sent me. And the same glory that you gave me, I have given it unto them, that they would be one, just as we are one. I in them, you and me, that the world would know that you sent me. Father, that they would know that the love that you have for me, you have for them. And Father, I pray that I would be in them. If you've seen me, You've seen the Father. It's the Father on the inside of me that's doing the works. On that day of salvation, you'll know that I'm in the Father. The Father's in you, and I am in you, and you are in me. You'll know on the day of salvation. On that day that I live, you will live also. All of these wonderful statements Jesus made was to show you who you are. To show you who you are. And so I just want to encourage you tonight, as, as we leave tonight, if you've been dealing with some physical issues, if you've been dealing with some physical issues, I want you to spend some time tonight looking at you. 
I didn't say your physical issues. I'm talking about you. I'm not talking about the house that you live in. I'm talking about spend some time looking at you. And if you're having a hard time understanding what you look like, just start looking at Jesus. Start thinking about Jesus. Start identifying as him. Start seeing yourself as the one who people are just trying to touch because healing power is flowing out of you. Start seeing yourself as that person. Start seeing yourself as the water walker. Start seeing yourself as a person standing before the cave and calling Lazarus out. Start seeing yourself as the person that's multiplying the food. Start seeing yourself as that person because that is the one you're united to. Say this with me. I'm one with him. And he's one with me. It's no longer I who lives, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life that I live in this flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God. I've got the faith of Jesus Himself. It's no longer I who lives. It's Christ who lives in me. I will not set aside the grace of God by stepping outside of my union with Him. He is the vine and I am the branch and all that flows in Him It flows in me. As He is, so I am I. Right now. As Jesus is, seated at the right hand of God. So am I, sitting in this chair. Come on, use your imagination right now. I want you to begin to see that. See Jesus at the right hand of God. At the highest of the high in the throne room of God. And begin to see yourself in the very same place. Because actually the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 that you were raised up with Him and made to sit down with Him at the right hand of God in Christ. As He is seated at the right hand of God, so are you right now. So are you right now. Just as righteous, just as holy, just as pure, just as pristine, filled with that very same glory, that very same life that resonates and reverberates in his body is the very same life that flows in your body right now. Your spirit is wall to wall, top to bottom, all the way around, filled to the full and overflowing with him. That's who you are. That's who you are. You're one with him. He's one with you. One with Him. He's one with you. That's your office. That's the place that we minister from. That's the place that we pray from. That's the place we raise the dead from. We cleanse the leper from. We cause the blind to see, the deaf to hear, the paralyzed to walk from that place. But it's also that place that I walk in my victory. That's that's that place that I declare the words of life into my life and into those situations in which the curse has tried to to dominate. It's from that place that I win. It's from that place that I live. It's from that place that I move and I have my being. I'm one with Him. Come on, every step I take, I'm making you. It's in Him that I live and I move and I have my being. I'm bone of His bone and I'm flesh of His flesh. I'm one with Him and He's one with me. I'm one with him and he's one with me. I've received him and now I walk in him. Now I walk in him. Now I walk in him. I see myself right now in the very same position that he is. Come on, I may be on the earth, but I've got the same dominion that he's got right now. I may be on the earth, but I've got the very same power right now. I've got dead raising power right now on the inside of me. Right here while I'm sitting here in these gray chairs, I've got enough power on the inside of me. I've got enough power on the inside of me. I've got enough power on the inside of me to take care of the most wretched problem in this world. I've got enough power on the inside of me that'll grow out a leg, grow out an arm, cause an eye to see, cause an eye to be formed. I've got enough power on the inside of me that it cause every tendon, every ligament, every bone in my body that's not functioning to begin to function with perfection. That the righteousness that I am will begin to right the wrongs that are in my body. 
that the dark spots that are in my lungs and the dark spots that are on your organs are being filled with light right now, being filled with life right now because of everything that flows in him now beginning to flow out of your spirit and beginning to impact your body. Come on, the righteousness of God producing this healing power flowing in your body. Not because anything that you've done, but because of everything that He's already done. He's sitting there on the throne, the place of victory, the place of preeminence, the place, the place of, 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 of the highest place of the universe. And yet that's where you're seated with everything that's of the curse far beneath your feet. Far beneath your feet. Far beneath your feet, far beneath your feet, far beneath your feet, all that he is flowing in you. See his hands as your hands and your feet as his feet. See his body as your body. Come on, your past is his past. Your future is his future. Your present is his present. All that he is, you are. The fullness of him and grace for grace. That's literally who you are right now. I'm a man in Christ. I'm a woman in Christ. Filled to the full and overflowing. No sickness and no disease could possibly be in my body. I'm so full of light that it drives out all of the darkness. In him was life and that life was the light of men. That light on the inside of me. That light on the inside of me, driving all of that out, driving out the arthritis out of every single joint in my body. Driving all of that out. That life, that light, causing that left hip to stay back into place. Come on, those joints where those bones joined together, that those things were rubbing bone on bone, and now supernaturally cartilage is beginning to form. Cartilage is beginning to form where it's not bone on bone, but things begin to function the way that God designed them to be. Not because you did anything, but be simply because you connected yourself once again, connected your soul to your spirit, which is filled with him and united with him and made like him, one with him. You're born of God and greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Come on, as is the heavenly man, so also those who are heavenly. He's a life-giving spirit. And he's filled you with his life. He's filled you with his power. He's filled you with his grace. He's filled you with him. Come on, bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. Your pores right now, just trying to hold back what's on the inside. Of it just trying to not ease on out of your pores and get into your clothes and get into the chairs. Come on, that you begin to see yourself like Peter did that day when he was walking down that road and people just wanted to get near him because of what was just flowing on the inside of him and flowing on the outside of him. Come on, if that would flow on the inside and flow on the outside for others, imagine what it would do on the inside of you. Imagine what it does for your body. Imagine what would happen if Jesus stepped in your body right now. Oh wait, he did on the day of salvation. He did on the day of salvation. He stepped in you. He stepped in you. It's in him that I live. And it's in him that I move. And it's in him that I have my being. I, my being, my being, my healing is in my being. Come on, my healing, it is in my being. It's not in my doing, it's in my being. My healing is in my being. My healing is in my being. My healing, it's in my being. It's in my being. And yet that's why it's working right now. Because I'm just being. I'm just being in Him. I'm just being in Him. I'm just sitting here and enjoying just being in Him. I'm just enjoying being in Him. And Him being in me. And all of that just beginning to work itself out. It's grace. By grace, you have been saved. By grace, you have been healed. 
By grace, you've been made righteous. By grace, you've been made holy. By grace, you've been made perfect. By grace, by grace, by the blood of Jesus Christ, this took place already for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, there's a shift taking place for some of you in here. There's a shift taking place on the inside. Not only in your brain, not only in your mind, but a shift taking place in your body right now. A shift taking place in your body right now. Why? Because you finally got out of the way. And you got back in him. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise be unto God. Praise be unto God. Praise be unto God. Praise be unto God. God. That you considered me worthy. You made me so righteous and holy to consider me to be your temple, to be your home. That you would move on the inside of me. To live on the inside of me. That was God's cry. That was his heart's cry. They will be my people. I will be their God. That I will dwell in them. I will walk in them. They will be my people. And I will be be their God. That was the heart cry of God. That was the heart cry of God. That was the heart cry of God. To once again be in my people. It was the crowning achievement of Jesus' life and ministry was the uniting of man and God back together once again. Hallelujah. That was the focus. That's what Jesus came to do. And thank God he finished the work and he did it to to perfection. He did it to perfection. The angels of heaven stand and look at you in absolute amazement. And what God made you to be in Christ. The angels stand amazed at you. The angels stand amazed at you. And cancer stands and trembles at you. Kidney disease trembles at you. Osteoarthritis trembles at you. Tumors and lumps, they tremble. They don't want you to get near and touch them. The things of the curse are begging and pleading. Don't let the Son of God. Don't let the daughter of God, don't let the child, don't let that one filled with him get near me. Don't let it touch me. Don't let it touch me because I'll have to go. Why? Because you're filled with light. You're filled with light. You're filled with light. And where light is, darkness has to go. The darkness cannot overcome the light. You are children of the light. You are the light in this world. You are the light. You are the light. So how could darkness stay in my body when I'm filled with light? When I am light, how could it stay? 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 stay? Come on, the very same light that flowed out of Jesus on the mountain of transfiguration, it's the very same light It's the very same glory that's on the inside of you right now. It's on the inside of you right now. It's on the inside of you right now. Where the glory is. Where the glory is. Where the glory is. Where the glory is. Oh wait, that's in me. Oh wait, that's in you. That's in you. The glory of the Father, the glory of the Son, the light and all that He is on the inside of me. 
on the inside of me. On the inside of me. On the inside of me. On the inside of me. On the inside of me. On the inside of me. On the inside of me. And yet that change in my body right now. That change in my body right now. Skin issues and skin problems being changed right now. Being changed right now. While you're just sitting there. While you're just sitting there. Skin problems being changed right now. Come on, I, that, that just keeps coming up about the arthritis. Just being burned out, burned out, burned out. That light like a laser, just burning things out. Burning things out. Burning things out. Burning things out. Causing nerves that weren't speaking to begin speaking once again. Communication taking place with the brain once again. Those synapses firing and talking once again. Come on, the light of God, the electricity of God, the electricity, the flames, the lightnings of God beginning to flash through the body once again. Hallelujah. Praise be unto God. Pray bones and, and muscles that have been deteriorating, those things being strengthened and refashioned and reformed once again. Come on, life flowing into those muscles. 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 Bones that had gotten brittle over time because you believed in the curse that as you got older, your bones had to get weaker. No, the life of God penetrating those bones. Penetrating those bones and producing life strengthening bone strengthening marrow strengthening those things friends if Moses as a sinner as an unsaved former murderer can live to be 120 with his eyesight not diminished his strength not diminished what's possible for a man or woman filled with God promised our 120 years satisfied with long life divine health what's possible for us that the older we get maybe just maybe the healthier that you get because yes. you're growing in revelation and yes. that produces manifestation yes. that when I turn 60 I'm not going over the hill I'm still going up <laughs> that even though I may be walking through the valley I'm slaying some devils yes. and I'm raising the dead because I'm so full of him because I'm so full of him because I'm so full of him. I'm so conscious of who I am. That when I go to sleep. Satan. He wipes his brow and says. Thank God he's going to bed. <laughs> and yet when you wake up in the morning. They begin to sound the bells of hell. And saying he's up. He's up. He's up. Everyone to your battle stations. He's up. He's up. That man. That woman. That knows who they are. Everybody get ready. It's going to be a bad day. Come on, because of who you are, we ought to be on Satan's number one most wanted list. Because of all the hell that we're raising. Demolishing these things. Manifesting the kingdom of God. Manifesting the kingdom of heaven. Righting the wrongs. Walking through life like Jesus. Because I see myself as one with him and yet absolutely entirely dependent on him. That the curse trembles when I walk into a room that's filled with cancers, filled with devils, filled with disease, filled with terminal things, filled with genetic things. That those things begin to tremble. That they just know they have to go at the word, at the touch, at the impartation of life. They know they got to go. Filled with them. Filled with him. Filled with him. Filled with him. Guys, if under the Old Testament and the Bible says that when they were dedica dedicating the temple and the glory of the Lord filled the house and the priest couldn't even stand up, what would happen with that same glory in your spirit and going into your body and that cancer can't stand up anymore to it? The disease can't even stand up. It has to bow. Because of what's on the inside. 
of what's on the inside. Something has to give when the supernatural hits the natural. Something has to give when God hits the curse and it ain't going to be Him. And yet if you're full of Him, if you're one with Him, if you're His child, if there's a greater one on the inside, something has to give. Something has to give. Something has to give. Start seeing for yourself for who you truly are. Hallelujah. 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 Glory be unto God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let the glory of God just begin to emanate from you. Filling this room. And changing the atmosphere. Just because of who you are. And who you've brought into the room. That everything changes. That everything changes. Come on, we've said it for years. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Friends, I've got news for you. The Spirit of the Lord is in you. The Spirit of God's on the inside of you. The Spirit of God's on the inside of you. The Spirit of God's on the inside of you. That means there has to be freedom. That means there has to be liberty. That means there's no more slavery. That means there's no more dominion and being bogged down by sin and bogged down by sickness and bogged down by addiction and bogged down by depression. It can't have a hold on me anymore because the greater one's on the inside. The God of the universe is on the inside. The King of kings and the Lord of lords is living on the inside of me right now. Hallelujah. 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 Come on. Some of you are experiencing freedom right now. You might as well go ahead and enjoy it. <laughs> you might as well go ahead and enjoy it. Some of you might need to take up and run. You might need to do some jumping jacks. You might need to do some things you couldn't do before. Why? Because all of a sudden, you found out who you were and you got free. Friend, don't tell me you've been believing and you've been depressed. Don't tell me you're in faith and you've got a frown on your face. The Bible says, may the God of hope fill you with all peace and joy in your believing. That means there ought to be peace and there ought to be joy. There ought to be a rest in my mind and there ought to be a smile and a laugh coming out of my mouth. Because I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. I'm not trying to get free. I stopped trying to get free when I walked in this room tonight. I stopped trying to get healed when I walked in this room tonight. I'm no longer trying to get healed. I'm enjoying my healing. I'm no longer trying to get free. I'm enjoying my freedom. I'm no longer working for it. I'm just enjoying it. Come on, I received him. Now I'm going to walk in it. I'm going to walk in it. Ha, 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 ha. I'm going to walk in it. I'm going to enjoy it right now. Woo, glory. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, isn't it good to be healed? Isn't it good to be free? Isn't it good to not be depressed anymore? Come on. Isn't it good not to have that holding me down anymore? Isn't it good not to be addicted to stuff anymore? Isn't it good just to be free? Just because of grace and what he provided. Isn't it so good to be healed? Woo! Isn't it good not to have arthritis anymore? Isn't it so wonderful? I could get up and go run a mile tomorrow if I want to. Because my lungs are working good now. My legs are working. I've got cartilage back in my knees now. Woo! Isn't it fun to be able to do that once again? Ha, 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 ha.
<laughs> Might want to go check on it. <laughs> Woo! Hallelujah. <sighs> Hallelujah. Who's got some stuff going on in your bodies? I mean, good stuff. You, you're seeing changes right now. Come on, there's some stuff happening in bodies. Yeah, yes, sir, what's going on? Huh? Pain leaving. What was going on? Arthritis. Hallelujah. What else? Somebody, somebody over here. What's something going on over here? Anybody have something going on over here? Yes, yes, ma'am. Confidence. Confidence. Who else has something going on in their body over here? Yes, ma'am. All the pain in my back and hips is gone. It's gone. What was going on before? I think it was more like arthritis. A chiropractor said it was osteoarthritis. Uh -huh. I was starting to have pain when I would walk. Yeah. Pain when I would just, just being was painful. Yeah. And tonight, just the power of God is just so hot right now. It is so hot right now. Um, there is no pain in my back or my neck. Praise God. Who else? Who else has something going on? Come on, I know there's more of you. What's what's going on? <coughs> Hallelujah! Praise the Lord! Yes, ma'am. You said the left hip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pain in my left hip, and that's just well, you might want to try it out a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I want you to notice what happened there. So so this has been going up. We, we started doing this about 45 minutes ago. And and we just kind of, well, I don't know about you, I closed my eyes and we just start kind of talking about some stuff and kind of using my imagination and seeing some stuff and talking a certain way and thinking a certain way. And then at some point, I kind of forgot you were here. <laughs> and and kind of you start kind of getting into a, a flow of some stuff. But you know what? This is what we can do at home. And what happens is your, your imagination starts running a little wild on the right side. And you start tapping into a flow of some things that God's wanting you to tap into. And all of a sudden, isn't it amazing, things just start to happen.